G'day fellas and welcome to a casted game. We are here on the brand new expansion for Age of Empires 4, The Sultan's Ascend. And boy oh boy do we have a matchup for you today. The two headline civilizations face to face up against each other on Dry Arabia. Let's introduce our players for today. On the south side of the map in the color red, playing as the Japanese, we've got Sass. And on the north side of the map, playing in the purple as the Byzantines. You may know him as the kid. It is Voldemar. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome, welcome, welcome. And boy, oh boy, do we have a beautiful biome for you today. This is the brand new Japanese spring, which is a DLC. I say DLC. It's an expansion biome. And I tell you what, you know what really helps us out? It is these damn well expansion biomes. I love these so much. It just, it motivates me to cast because they just look so damn good. This one together with the Savannah biome, I tell you what, the devs have done a great job with them. So shout out to it. Now, Another thing to note, these two civilizations, they're brand new. They're straight into this game. And it, look, there's going to be varying levels of experience that you guys have got with these civilizations. There's a good chance that this video is coming out before the expansion's even out yet. Uh, and in that case, there's not many people who are familiar with the mechanics. So I'm going to explain most of these mechanics like you've never seen the civs before. So I do ask that you be patient as we go through them and talk about them. So we'll start off in the north with the Byzantines because they do have access to this early system. Now it starts off nice and cheap. 50 stone is all you're going to pay, but it goes up every single time by 50 until you get five of them. At that point, I don't know what happens because I've never built more than five. And I'll be honest, I'm not really interested to. But essentially what it does is it buffs up all the villages in this golden circle. You can see it right here. Beautiful golden circle around the base. It hits the gold. It hits the front of the wood line and it hits the villages under the TC. Doesn't hit the berries. A little bit of a mistake here from Voldemar, I would say, because you'd want that to hit the berries. I'd be more tempted to throw like the system over here. That way it hits the berries, hits the gold, hits the villages under the TC. Uh, and that's a 5% bonus that your villages are going to be receiving, which is a nice bonus early on in this game. Now, the other thing to note, oh, we've got ourselves a nice little villager pop. Did you guys see that? He throws all the villas in the TC to just get that extra little bit of food. And our first landmark comes down. It's going to be the Grand Winery. Now, this landmark is a landmark that helps you produce your brand new unique resource. We can see right here, olive oil in that top left corner. This is a resource that you can acquire in a number of different ways. But the most common way that you'll see is through the Olive Grove, which is the unique farm for the Byzantines. A little bit cheaper than the standard farm. One other thing to note is that you're actually gathering at the full rate for food. You're just getting the olive oil on top of that. Further to that, the Grand Winery buffs that up. So instead of collecting 20% olive oil, you're now collecting 80% olive oil. Uh, at least I think that's how it works. It could be 60%. I haven't done the tests. I'll be honest with you guys, but it, it's a lot. Uh, and you also get olive oil from your berry bushes as well. And that's why we can see them being placed here on the berry bushes. So a nice little position that Voldemar has got already in this base. But let's ride over onto the other side of the map as Voldemar is beginning to explore exactly what Sass is up to. And we can see that Forge has come down over on the gold vein here for Sass. Now, keep in mind, the Forge is a unique mining camp replacement slash blacksmith replacement. This guy is only 50 wood. It's a very cheap thing to build. You can see right there, 50 wood for the Forge. And it also holds a unique technology called Tatara. Uh, and basically, it gives the Japanese access to an additional plus one melee attack, which is pretty big when you think about it. Because now all of a sudden in the Dark Age you've got plus one, in the Feudal Age you've got plus two. And if you're doing, say, five or six damage with some of these units, that's a really effective bonus to your damage. So a great upgrade there. We do see the landmark he's opting for going for the Kura Storehouse. So both of these players looking to take the economic route. Both of these civs do have uh, aggressive uh, options as well. And a curious position, I, I was going to say, a very curious position for this uh, forge to be thrown down out towards this stone outcropping, but it looks like the villagers will be coming back towards the backside of the base and looking to place the forge in. Very well placed here by Sass, making sure to respect the Kura storehouse. One of the things to remember with this landmark is that farms will spawn around this landmark. And if you do build a building where those farms should spawn, it will not build them there. Uh, now, keep in mind, once you have no space left to build these farms you're going to be receiving a trickle of wood but still it's nice to have those farms and you can see he does the right thing working that farm immediately upon getting it so the age ups have come through for both of these players one of the unique buildings that we haven't talked about yet for the japanese is their farmhouse the farmhouse is a mill and a house in one so it's great to try and get these out on the map if you've got the ability to you know throw down a house out here on the hunt throw it down over on the berry bushes then that way you're killing two birds with one stone 
You're getting a house, you're dropping a mill as well. So a little bit of future proofing that goes on. But now it looks like we've got an archery range coming down for Sass. The Japanese have got access to unique archers. The, if I remember correctly, they're called the Ashigari, Ashuga, sorry, Ashigaru Yumi, uh, which is, is what two units in Age of Empires 3 were called. You had the Ashigaru Masketeer and you had the Yumi Archer. So they kind of put them into one here. Uh, and it is a cheap unit, a super duper cheap unit, uh, much cheaper than the standard Archer. Second TC coming for Voldemar, very nice. Uh, does get spotted out by his opponent. Uh, but es essentially, it is a much cheaper unit, uh, and it, it's essentially s uh, slightly more damage. But th this unit, in my opinion, is crazy good, and I'm really excited to see that Sass is going to be going for a huge amount of them as he throws down the second archery range here. See that he's added in plenty of farms. One thing to note is that it's a lot less wood to be building the Yumi Ashigaru. A normal archer costs 50 wood, uh, whereas this one's only 35, so that's a pretty decent difference that you're actually getting, but... There are trade-offs. As an example, you're only doing four damage. And it might not seem like much of a difference between, say, four and five damage. But once you start taking into account armors, it can be a very big difference. Because it could be the difference between doing one effective damage and two effective damage. So that's where the Yumi may be doing half the damage of what an archer could be doing. Or, you know, one third of what a longbow could be doing. So very important to consider. But we'll head towards the base of Voldemar and see how he's doing as he begins to connect his sister network with an aqueduct in the middle. These build pretty quick. And it's important to note that you are supplemented throughout the game with stone. So every building that you build, with the exception, I think, of walls, it will reward you stone. So it depends on the footprint size of the building. So for small buildings like the outpost, like the house, like the cistern here, uh, these guys are only going to reward you eight, uh, eight stone. Uh, whereas a larger building, like a barracks, is going to reward you more stone, and then a super large building, like a town center, is going to reward you even more. And I suspect if you built a, la a uh, wonder, which is 6x6 six six tiles, you'd be getting some real good stone, but it's probably a little bit less than the 5,000 stone it costs you to make it. So don't be looking at that as an investment strategy, but speaking of investment already, we can see Sass investing early on in his Yumi Ashigaru. Not the Ar Ashigaru Yumi, but the Yumi Ashigaru. Uh, so I had those ones around the wrong way. Now, there's a couple of other little mechanics that you may have picked up. Uh, one of the other things to note is that the uh, the Japanese have got access to a unique wheelbarrow upgrade. Uh, so they don't get your standard wheelbarrow upgrade. They don't get your standard horticulture. What they do get, it is a villager technology that increases the movement speed of the, uh, of the villager, also increases the carry capacity, and also increases the berry uh, gather rate. So what that means is... Uh, the way I like to do it as the Japanese is you don't really go onto the berries until you hit feudal, at which point you pick up both of the upgrades. So you're essentially going into it with 50% gather rate on your berry bushes. On top of that, you've also got the extra carry capacity, which is very nice. Helps out with the farms, and you can see that these vills are dropping off 13 at the moment. Uh, now, another thing to note is that the Kura storehouse can be used as a drop-off uh, location. And once these... So if you were to build the Kura storehouse right against the wood line, you can drop off directly to it. And once those wood lines have been chopped through, uh, the Kura storehouse will then spawn farms in those positions. So that's important to note is that it, it, it will go and, and look to do that. But aggression already coming out from Sass here. And we can see now it looks like he's invested into a Daimyo Menor, which is the second level of the Japanese town center. So the first one, it's the base town center that everybody gets. The second level is a little bit different costs 300 stone to do this. It's a, a relatively expensive, but it gives a number of bonuses. Number one is that it increases the villager gather rate. All of the villagers that are nearby on farms are going to be receiving an additional 25% gather rate for their farming. That's insane when you think about it. A normal horticulture upgrade, it's 15%. You're getting 25% with that 300 stone upgrade. You also unlock, in addition to that, a, a, the ability to train a Bannerman. Now, the Benaman has come through. It is the Yumi Benaman. We can see it here at the top. There we go. And what that's going to do is that's going to buff up all nearby units. You can see and you can tell it apart because it's actually, uh, with, with the Benaman, it's got that special ability and it blocks incoming attacks. Uh, so it is the deflective armor. Uh, and that's what sets it apart. And look at the movement speed coming out from these Yumis already. 1.38 movement speed as fast as a palace guard these guys are. So really incredible units. Uh, and uh, and Sass now was looking to, to go on the offense, but we can see that Voldemar's turned it around on him and now beginning to look to hit his opponent with the horseman. I'm curious if he's picked up Expilatories just yet. Let's take a look and see. No, it doesn't look like he has for anybody unfamiliar with Expilatories. It is a unique upgrade available to the Byzantines that allows their horsemen 
to do a little bit more damage against workers and also collect a 20 gold bounty for every worker that they kill on it. It's a super cheap upgrade, so I definitely recommend picking it up early on if you plan to make horsemen, if you plan to make a mess in the enemy base. But speaking of messes in the enemy base, have a look at this. A little bit of an interesting, uh, you know, bit, bit of feedback. I don't know if Voldemar watches it, but or watches the videos. But look, even if he doesn't, this is feedback for you and your play style whenever you're playing the Byzantines. One of the things to note is that the Grand Winery has a pretty small AoE. And this AoE increases the amount of olive oil that your olive groves drop off. So these ones over here, we can see that the villagers aren't really doing a lot when it comes to collecting olive oil. They're collecting plenty of food, which is normal, but the olive oil, it's a little bit slow. Compare that to your villagers that are immediately adjacent, and it is going to be significantly greater numbers of olive oil. At least it should be. You can see it's kind of picking up right there, five and two. I did see it at one point. It should be eight and three. There we go, eight and three. So it, it's a much larger amount of olive oil that you're getting. So these early farms, ideally, should be around this Grand Winery. Because remember, this Grand Winery does act as a food drop-off point as well. So it's like a big farm, a big, uh, big mill, I guess is the better way to say it. But on the other side of the map, now, in the north of the base, we have got the floating gate being dropped down by Sass. Now, keep in mind, Sass is a little bit behind when it comes to the economy side of things, simply because his opponent's on 2TC, he's on the 1TC. It looks like Vil's under threat here. Unsure if the Exploratory's upgrade has come through just yet. We can actually click on these units and see. We can see that it doesn't have a bonus against Villagers, and therefore it's not going to be the case. I would recommend Sass needs to cancel this floating gate and put it next to the town center. You just want to get this bad boy down next to the TC immediately. Oh, now he's in a little bit of trouble here. Voldemar stalling him out. The floating gate, only three bills going to be working their way through it. Looking to pick up those unique upgrades for melee attack. The Tatara upgrade now coming through. And units on the way back. He's going to be looking to try and defend this here with these archers. The Yumi now coming through. Villagers do get caught. One of them going to go down. It's the first one in the game. He's also got these Ona Bugashas. I forgot exactly how to pronounce these. Ona Bugasha. There you go. They're kind of like the Bugatti, the way that they go so fast. Look at them go, man. 1.5 movement speed, and they ain't even charging, baby. They're, look at that one go. 1.8 movement speed. Catch me if you can. These guys running around like Leonardo DiCaprio right now. Quick wall coming in over on the east side of the base. He's trying to take out the villagers before the wall can complete. Complete. He's managed to do it. A couple of these walls are quite low. 12 health on that one. He, he spots it, goes through, and he's going to make it out safe, only losing out the two horsemen there and Voldemar, managing to keep the majority of those cavalry units alive. Very nicely played in the early game there for him. So, whew, geez Louise, these guys, these guys know how to play, that is for sure. Oh, all right. Well, so we've got a tech advantage for Sass. We've got a villager advantage for Voldemar. Where does that put them in terms of advantage? And I would say the advantage would sit with Voldemar. Uh, however, there's one thing to note, and that is our Yoroshiro. The Yoroshiro are now in. They come in from the floating gate, and it looks like he's going to be putting them in the forge. This is the best place that you can put them, and you can see it denoted by this little piece on the corner here. The Yoroshiro is a unique mechanic to the Japanese. Think of it kind of like a relic. The way that it works is you pick it up, you carry it with your Shinto priest, and then you put it in a building. The building acts as like a monastery. And depending on which building you decide to put it in depends on the bonus that it gives your civilization. As an example, if you put the, the Yoroshiro in a, in a town center, it's going to increase the production rate of that town center. So it means that instead of your villagers training in 20 seconds, they train in 16 seconds, which is pretty cool when you think about it. He hasn't gone for it here. One of the other bonuses, and we'll hover over the uh, the Shinto priest. He should be somewhere around here. Let me see if I can find him. I might be on the front here. Never mind. We've lost him. Has he got one? He's, he's got one. Oh, he's probably picking up a relic. Here we go. So these are the bonuses. So you've got the farmhouse, which gives 75 food per minute. The lumber camp, which gives 75 wood per minute. The forge, which gives 75 gold per minute. And definitely my favorite because it's basically a relic at that point. The Wonder gives it some more health. Military and Docks gives them a higher work rate. And the Town Center increases the production speed as well. So I'm definitely a fan of putting the Yoroshiro in the Forge. Just simply because it is gold that you're going to be able to use all game. Whereas with the, the Villager or the Town Center, it's like you, you get that 25% extra production speed. But once you're maxed out on Vils, you don't really notice it. And you can always just make it a, a second Town Center, right? If you want to do it. So that's an option for you. Uh, the other other big one is the uh, throwing them in military production buildings is really nice because it means that you can turn, say, two barracks into six barracks. And we've seen that players do that before. But 
It, it, uh, I guess another thing to note is that the floating gate uh, provides infinite amounts of Yoroshiro, but they spawn in, I think it's one every four minutes. Gotta be careful right now. Horsemen heading, going headfirst, or rather I should say the... Uh, the the uh, the Yumi are running headfirst into the Horsemen. Horsemen, fortunately, able to run away from the the enemy units on the front line. It looks like it's just going to be the Honor Bugattis. <laughs> I'm going to start doing it in the Samurai. No Spearmen out just yet. Keep in mind, we do have access to the Spearmen, though we're just not choosing to make it. Uh, so the Honor Bugatti, the, <laughs> I'm going to call it, it's the Honor Bugatti. Uh, it is so damn quick. This is a bit of an interesting unit because it doesn't have any bonus damage against anything, so it doesn't specialize against any unit. But what it does have is attack speed. So it does attack once every 0.9 of a second, which is kind of crazy when you think about it. This guy is, is just flinging out attacks. He's also got a really long attack range. So it's a nice support unit. I, d I wouldn't recommend just spamming these bad boys out and only these bad boys. You'd probably want to mix a couple of samurai in, which are essentially your men at arms, but they are much cooler, both in looks and in actual abilities. Very, very cool units. Uh, but yeah, just going back to the floating gate and the Yoroshiro, it, it respawns these every four minutes infinitely throughout the game. And I love this. I think this is such a cool mechanic because it means if you don't go and look for these Yoroshiro in the enemy base, right? Because Voldemar knows that he, that his opponent has gone for the floating gate. So right now he needs to say to himself, okay, I need to find those Yoroshiro and I need to burn them down. Because once you burn them down, say once if you burn down this, this forge, that's it. The Yoroshiro, it dies with it. It's not like a relic where it drops out onto the ground. It's gone. It's dead. And I think that that's a great way to balance it. Because if your opponent does get to the point where they've got four, five, Five, six Yoroshiro, that's like four, five, six relics. That's a lot. And you might say that there's no counterplay to that, but there is. You gotta go and find those buildings, you gotta siege them down. So I, th I think I'm probably waiting for, for the next change in the meta where you'll just see players building all of their all of their uh <laughs> all of their forges on the back, stonewalling them in and then putting their Yoroshiros inside it just to keep them safe. I suspect that's probably where we're gonna see it go eventually though. Uh just so that you can avoid being sniped out. I mean you could probably even just throw them down here. As long as they're stonewalled, that'll be okay. But now, infantry numbers starting to look pretty good for Sass here. It looks like we might have a little bit of an engagement. The question's going to be whether he wants to stick it or not. Falls back away from that front line. A lot of samurai out now on the field. Samurai are incredibly strong. One of the main reasons why they're so strong is because of this deflective armor. It deflects armor. Oh, sorry, the deflective armor can block one melee or ranged attack and recharges while out of combat for eight or I mean, in eight seconds, which is pretty cool for little skirmishes because you're able to neutralize one attack and then move on and, and, and come back in and look to try and challenge it again. Continuing to pick up relics. So he's already got two. One of them in the bag. Second one on the way back in. Third one about to get picked up now. There we go. Beautiful. Absolutely love it. Now towards the middle of the map, we might have ourselves a bit of an engagement here as the infantry and the cavalry have decided that the stealth forest is going to be the best place for it. Better man going to go down. You can see the banner being dropped onto the ground. Looks like the Bugattis continue to move forward. <laughs> the Bugatius, sorry. I, I shouldn't call them by their real name. And we've also got some mounted uh, some mounted crossbowmen coming out here. I can't remember the exact name for them, but I'll, I'll check in with you shortly. We'll check in with them shortly. It looks like we might have a little bit of a break in play right now. Let's, uh, let's see if I can get the, the UI back in. So this is called the Honor Musha. Uh, we, we've got a brand in Australia called Musashi. So I'll just try and think of Musashi when I think of these guys. It's going to take me a while to learn the name, so I do apologize in advance. These guys are crossbows on cavalry. I was going to say on steroids. That's not true. They're not on steroids. They're on cavalry. Slightly different. Uh, a little bit more expensive. Uh, that's, that's the main trade-off that you've got. Looks like we did lose that relic towards the middle of the map. And now look at the units numbers beginning to stream out. We've also got the Manganel coming out from Voldemar. The main thing I'm worried about here is the Cataphract. I'm curious to see whether he's picked up the unique upgrade for the Cataphract just yet. Doesn't look like it. And never mind, of course he hasn't. It's in Imperial Age Numeri, uh, which is the Trample, uh, where it, it kind of goes crazy, the Trample. But let's take a look back at the base for Voldemar and see exactly how it's looking. One of the most aesthetic bases you can get. He's at tier 5 or level 5 when it comes to the system. So his villagers are just working overtime. What a beautiful base. I, I, I just, I love them. I love the bases of the Byzantines. They're just so damn good. So now, the Japanese defense. The question is going to be whether it can happen. The main difference between these two players at the moment is the villager count. Sass is down quite a few villagers, but keep in mind he is up on the relics. He is up on the Yoroshiro. That is going to be a primary driver here for it. But we start to see it. Looks like mercenaries have been recruited. Veteran longbowmen are out on the field looking to pick up some of those Western mercenaries. Cataphract number looking pretty good here as well. He's up to 12 Cataphract. Two more in queue. And slowly working it down. We're going to head into the cinematic mode once again as the Mangonels look to battle it out. Taking shots off at each other's side. 
And now, a keep going to be coming down inside the base of his opponent. Cataphracts could look to charge the Manganelki. One of the new mechanics available to the Cataphract is the ability to charge through enemy lines. They ignore units and just go straight for it. Let's see if he's going to pick it up. He doesn't go for it today. Not opting for it. Just going to run right up to it. We hear a Wallalol, but we don't see a Wallalol. It's not going to matter at the moment. The main... Oh, there it is. Now, never mind. There's the Wallalol. Trying to pick off some of those villagers. Second Wallalol comes in. He's trying to pick him off again. Will he be able to find it? Villagers do fall back. He's got another relic in there if he wants to have another go. The question's going to be whether he goes for it. He's got a third one he can do. Manganel still firing off. And you can see just how much damage that cavalry's managed to do. The cataphracts running behind enemy lines. And now on the front of the base, the keep gets up. 32 stone in the coffers. Thank you. Come again. That's what she said. And I tell you what, it looks like that might be all she wrote. Speaking of her, uh, that is definitely all she wrote for this game. Because this one, it is well and truly done. I'm telling you right now, the fact that Voldemar has got such a, an, an advantage when it comes to the eco lead, he's in his opponent's base killing their dudes, and at this point, it is just pretty much GG. He's going to try his best to, to defend from here, but the reality is, is that landmarks can be taken out from this position because of this keep. This keep is going to serve as a wonderful platform, and well, this keep will also serve as a wonderful platform for this attack. It's going to be able to steal out the relics. It's going to leave his opponent in a very difficult position, but it looks like Sassy is going to continue fighting, at least for the moment. Right on board with him as he tries his... <laughs> there it is, ladies and gentlemen. The game is called with our Byzantine player victorious as the Lynch Connect roll on in. Ladies and gentlemen, make sure you check out these two creators. I'll leave a link in the description to where you can watch them live. And make sure you check out the Sultan's Ascent. I'll leave a link to where you can pre-order it over on Steam right now.